good evening or whatever it is. I'm running. This is my third event I've been to this morning. A lot of uh, yard parties and, and uh, different engagements. Um, but what's happening with the pier currently is um, it's, it's slated to be closed on May 31st. If you've been following, you know, I've been swinging hard for the, the people that work out there, the people that have got to live and feed their families and pay their mortgages and, and run their businesses, and they've been out there a long time. So I thought it robbery not to at least let them um, remain open and, and earning an income until August 27th is when they have the primary. And the, the, the question of stopping the lands and canceling the contract with, with Michael Molson will be on the ballot along with the mayor and half of council. So I thought maybe that would make a little sense to let them stay open until the end and then we'll have a clear direction on which way the people want to go. How we got here was pretty much putting the, the cart before the horse. Um, over 24 months ago, I'm going to say about, oh, actually about three years ago, that um, the uh, council went down the path of uh, selecting a, a peer um, committee to go out and see what would be the, uh, the best way to, to uh, replace the peer that's being one of the voters. So each one of us got to select a member from our district to go and sit on this committee. This committee spent countless hours, a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, um, citizen input sessions and everything, and came back with a recommendation. Commission that we, we uh, empowered to come back with a recommendation. They brought, brought the recommendation back, and, and then council quickly kicked it to the side and went on their own direction. And that's how we pretty much got where we're at. Um, the current status is, um, I know that the current concerned citizens have uh, over 16,000 Bulletproof petitions, and what I mean by bulletproof is I've signed one, you sign the petition, it's witnessed, and then it's notarized. And on the back of it is, is the ordinance to cancel the contract of Michael Molson, which is the design of the, uh, the toilet bowl or the lens or whatever. You know. <laughs> um, but uh, I know that that's more than enough. There was a petition earlier that I signed, I was the first one to sign, vote on the pier, and um, we had elected officials in their infinite wisdom chose to suppress the the will of the voters. Um, and that judge, Judge Day, is an elected official, just like myself and the rest of the people that sat there and, and then you get a, a people that put them there that loan us the power. This power is not ours. It's a loan to us from the people. It's government by the people, for the people. And the only tool that the people have against elected officials is the petition. That's it. On the state level, the governor and legislature, they're, they're exempt from the rules that they pass. But here locally, the county commission, the mayor, the city councilman, they, they uh, are subject to a petition, and that's why they make it so hard. We have 160,000 uh, individuals electric in the city of St. Petersburg, which is 60 square miles wide, uh, 250,000 people. You have to get 10% of that electric. Not that they vote, but they make you get 10% of that, which is 16,000 voters or 16,000 petition signs. They get anything on the ballot. Uh, the, the previous uh, petition came up with over 23,000 signatures by St. Petersburg voters. 23,000. 16,000, I'm sorry, 15,652 was verified by the SOE. The same way we get on the ballot. If you're going to run for office, you got to go out and get petitions signed. People got the petitions and they got to be in their district. And then the SOE looks at them and she verifies them. And once you meet that burden, then you can be put, placed on the ballot. Same way. Same thing we use. People did that. And the judge saw fit to uh, disregard that, even though he saw clear intent of the voters. And all they wanted to do was vote on an asset that belongs to them. It belongs to the people of St. Petersburg, the citizens, the taxpayers, and not a bunch of self-serving politicians. That's just the way it is. And when a politician rises up and wants to build monuments to themselves at the expense of the voters, that's wrong. And the people, the only recourse they have is to rise up. I'm just appalled why people ain't storming City Hall with pitchforks and shovels and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, if you look, Thursday was the worst. Mm -hmm. That would be the worst day yet on council. To see all of my colleagues sit around and just ignore all those people, making them passionate uh, pleas to let me stay open, let me feed my family, you know, just until they vote. You know what I'm saying? Just until the people vote. Everybody's looking down, doing emails and reading papers and playing games on computers. They didn't even care. They didn't even care. And I made a motion to uh, keep the pick open until the uh, 27th, just a motion. I couldn't even get a second for conversation. And, and the sad part about it is that the, 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 the 
the uh, position of any party, Democrat, Republican, Independent, is to try to stack the deck, to get enough of your members up there to be able to vote and push whatever your will through. I got four other colleagues, Democrats, sitting there right next to me, to my left, and I couldn't even get a second on the motion. Five of us are up there. It only takes five votes. Five of us could have saved 400 jobs in the city of St. Pete. We just shed 800 jobs when Universal went belly up on Central in the downtown core. 800 people, poof, out of work. How are they going to feed their family? How are they going to pay their mortgage? How are they going to live? You know, that's all. And we have that power. And unfortunately, when you got people in elected positions that never had a hard day in their life, never struggled or wanted for anything, everything has been given to them. Silver spoons, not silver spoon, gold spoons. <laughs> I mean, so they don't, they don't have a problem uh, being governed. So to them, it's a game. It's all it is. It's all it is. I don't see a crime in, in three more months of, uh, of letting these people earn money, and then from that point, you can uh, do whatever you want. You have clear guidance. But we did that because you did not put the voters first. You know, a wise man once said to me, he always talks third party. He said, you know, he said, you know what I do? He said, Newton, he said, I, First of all, let them vote. Let them vote. He said, I, I put a question on the ballot. I'll say, you know, do you want to keep the period and fix it up? Or do you want to tear it down and do something new? He said, then after they vote, I will take that information and then I will go, go with it. That man was Rick Baker. That was the same man in the previous administration that wanted to tear down after what they for it, if you remember. The people didn't want them to tear down after what they for it. The people went out and got petitions. The mayor then, Rick Baker, let them vote. And over 70% of the people say, you will not tear down this airport. And now we have a vibrant airport mm -hmm. in the city of St. Pete at the world of the people. And if you don't learn from your history, you're destined to repeat it. The last major uh, construction, well, the last major event of trying to put someone on that waterfront, if you remember, it was a major league baseball team that wanted to fill in half of the bay and put a stadium on the waterfront. And the people said, hell no. And, and previous to that, the last major thing that the city constructed, if you've been around, I was born and raised in St. Pete, it was the, uh, the Suncoast Dome or the, the Thunder Dome or Tropicana Fields, we know it now. And they used 30 to 40% of the taxpayers' money, and they did not let the people vote. Hmm. So obviously, you're not learning anything from this. And, and like I said, this power is not ours. It belongs to the people. So I'm hopeful that everybody will push to get people to go out and vote on August 27, which coincidentally happens to be my 50th birthday. So it's going to be a great day all the way around because hopefully um, democracy will prevail and the people will finally be heard on what they want. My only fear is that by the time that happens, these self-serving politicians will be there and destroy the pier. And then uh, the contract with the lens will be canceled and now you got nothing. I don't understand. There's no plan B. This plane has been hit two or three times, it's going down, and nobody has a parachute. So they're just going to act like they don't see the smoke and they're going to keep flying until it crashes. And that's unfortunate because those are the quality and the caliber of people that the electric have put into, into place. And I, I just don't understand that this part of it bothers me. But you know, I've been praying on it and praying on it, and I think I see something that might work. I got this out of this morning's paper. I just, St. Pete Times or the Tampa Bay Times or whatever the name is today, they keep changing it. But it says the Army uh, uh, Corps uh, wants your input and your feedback. The Army Corps of Engineers on the pier. It says the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is accepting public comment about the city's plan to build a new pier. The city is seeking a permit to demolish the inverted pyramid, um, 230,000 square feet. Um, inverted pyramid and to build a new 121,000 foot pier known as the Lens or sidewalk to nowhere. Uh, the current pier <laughs> is scheduled to close on May 31st with demolition following in late summer. And I think all this is in the summer, last time I checked. I don't know, it might be. Uh, comments about the proposed, um, excuse me, comments about the proposed work uh, to be submitted in writing by May 3rd. And uh, the district engineer of Tampa uh, permit section, and that's uh, the address is 10117 Princess Palm Avenue, Suite 120, Tampa, Florida, 33610-8302. Or you can email them by um, emailing D-A-R-L, 
E N E dot Daniels at U S A C E dot Army dot Mill. Or you can fax them at 813-769-7061. Since the public notice a, the public notice and support supporting documents are available at their website also, which is www.saj.usace.army.mil. I think this is an opportunity to, um, and I already put it on my Facebook page and Twitter and blog there, and, and our LinkedIn. But um, I think it's an opportunity for the people to try to compel the Army Corps of Engineers to at least wait to issue a permit until August, throughout the August 27th. I don't wait three months, it's gonna hurt. Last time I checked, the structure was sound until 2015 or 2016. And even better, if you close the peer approach to vehicular traffic, which is what's being proposed by this lens, it'll last even longer. Because the cars running around it is what's doing. You just get a train and go down the middle and, and bring people back and forth and for emergencies and for deliveries. But don't allow any more cars to park or go on it. It'll last even longer. Um, yeah. one, one thing that you might want to look at is price tag of $50 million. And Thursday's uh, council meeting, and none of my colleagues even questioned this. When the uh, concerned citizens were asking them about the safety of the um, structure, and being, being with and having uh, motorized vehicles and EMS trucks or fire trucks and stuff going out there, the answer by staff was we're looking to increase the, the top walk area of the tire circumference of the the uh, lens by two feet. So two feet of concrete <laughs> on the entire structure. I don't think that maybe that's going to be free. I don't think that's going to add to the $50 million they're already saying. But nobody asked that, you know. And unfortunately, when we're set, the next stage is uh, on May 2nd, which is my son's birthday. Uh, they, 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 the pigs are coming back to the trough. They want another $1.2 million year tax dollars to uh, keep throwing down this wormhole. Um, I made a motion over. 36 months ago to let the people vote on this thing and it fell for lack of a second. I even made a motion to have a public hearing even before we got this far. The argument now is we spent so much money, we did so much work, we can't go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the argument. Done in the first place. Well, that's, that's the argument. But unfortunately, that's, that's where it's sitting. I would urge the people to stay engaged. My mode, as you can see now, was really to of advocacy and, make, and making sure people get out to the poll. I'm going to do all I can to try to keep those jobs in place as we run and, and we come and knock and talk to you, you and you. We always say we're going to create jobs and economy and blah, blah, blah. But here we are with our eyes wide open getting ready to share 400 jobs of people that's got to feed their family, pay their mortgages, and, and try to live and put their kids in school or college or whatever. We're going to do it with our eyes wide open. I just don't understand that. I don't. So, but that's all I got. I appreciate you guys having me come out and speak to you. And if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting out of here easy. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, what is the latest on the um, the pedestrian walkway, the old Andy Bridge? Uh, my opinion, there's nothing wrong with it other than the timing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They have trucks and cars, but walkers. You know, isn't there a way to prevent the demolition of the old game bridge, the walkway, so that people can walk? I'm not, I'm not really sure what they're doing with that, because that's county. Oh. And I know half of this county, the other half is Hillsborough County. Oh, and they've been doing different things. I, I've been kind of keeping track a little bit on that. And I think that last check they had it closed off, and they were saying it was, it was going to be almost as much to, to tear it down as to fix it up, something like that. So I don't know where that's at. Okay. But I would say be, be vigilant, be looking at whatever public meetings they have or inputs and go over and speak to them. When you see a county commissioners, you know, yank them to the side, ask them about it. My model is only dumb questions the one you don't have. Because you don't know it and you ain't asking, so now you still don't know. <laughs> so, and I'm standing here, so who else can I'm sorry, yes sir. Yeah, my question is a little bit on, on the side because I wasn't paying a great deal of attention to it until I saw that the county is paying for 25 percent and well, i'm in the county and i don't get a vote at all well, it's not why 20, don't i it's not 25 percent it's 50 percent 
Oh. What he's talking about. Well, that's what that's what the mayor said. We were paying 25. Now we're paying 50, and we still don't get a vote. It was 50. What it is? He's talking about the tax increment funding, and, and you'll love this because this is the way they got to the 50 million dollar price tag. When you have a, 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 a an asset and you want to see what you can do with it, you go out and only your high professional consultant to look at it and give you some ideas of something you can do with that dollar amounts, time frames. Whatever you can do to make it better, how to improve it. Well, we have a, a consultant report that came out in 2004, and it called for um, um, the, the demolishing the 1926 approach and the base head around the pit, because the, 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 uh, all that is original 1926 construction. But it also called for uh, four to six million dollars for renovating the inverted pyramid. The inverted pyramid in the middle sits on caissons mm -hmm. that are down in the water that was built in the late, opened I think in the mid to late 70s. So that's, that, that's good for another 30 years by itself. It ain't going nowhere. In fact, if you look at all the plans of the sidewalk to nowhere, uh, they're gonna build some, some of that up on where the pier is sitting. But, they, but this thing is, they're telling you that the pier is crumbling. So if the pier is crumbling, when they put this sidewalk to nowhere up there, it's gonna crumble too. Unless it's a different kind of crumbling, maybe it's me, but, but that tells me there's nothing wrong with the structure. Again, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the, um, Tax increment funding, they came up with the dollar amount was $50 million. And what you can do as a, as a municipality is go to the county if you've got a plan for that money which is generated in your area, but it's due to the county. If you look at your Avalon, your tax statement, you pay city tax, you pay county tax, depending on where you're at. I pay city and county. If you're in Lelman, you probably pay county. Or Seminole, I think it's just county. It depends on where you're at, but you pay city and county taxes. Well, that, that tax revenue is rightfully due to the county, it's due to Pinellas County. And what they've done is they asked the county, would you let us use that $25 million and we'll put $25 million with it to use as bondable debt to uh, build this pier? And that's how they got to the 50. So half of that $50 million, $25 million, is Pinellas County tax revenue. It belongs to the Pinellas County tax coffers. The ideology is that um, you can keep that tax money generated in your city which happened to be in the county in your city. So that's what that is all about. Um, the um, proposed, uh, once they make a loan uh, on that money, $50 million, suppose a 30-year bond, and the debt service payment is going to be around $3.8 million a year. So your kids, grandkids, and my grandkids, grandkids will be paying this. Well, I, have a, I have a problem with that because the money that St. Petersburg pays the county, Saint, uh, the county pays for emergency services in St. Petersburg. So that means that the rest of us in the county is going to pay for emergency services in St. Petersburg while their tax money is going to appear. Well, it's, it's so that means different. we're subsidizing St. Petersburg. Not necessarily. The EMS is a little different. If you look on the... It still yeah. comes out of, count, out of county money because they don't even get to say how much they get to spend. No, I'm trying to explain to you. Okay. If you look on your tax thing, it'll show that uh, along with paying city tax, PSTA, JWB, county tax, you pay EMS tax too. And the reason uh, St. Petersburg is the largest city in the county, they pay more into that tax. And what you're talking about is they have two plans, they have a, a closed firefighter plan and an open one. And some of those people in that plan is retiring or it's requiring a higher contribution. And um, so therefore the county is um, paying the city of St. I think it's around $12 million uh, for EMS which is those, those, those uh, square boxes you see. Now, we propose a solution to that, uh, and that's to uh, have the firefighters do what they call uh, transport, because mm -hmm. in that whole system, the whole EMS system is 20 boxes and throughout the whole Pinellas County. Yeah. 10 of those boxes with the EMS trucks. 10 of those boxes sit in St. Petersburg. Also, um, it's about roughly anywhere between 12 to $15 million of the transport money that the company out of Texas get that they transport the money out of the city is made in St. Pete. They do all the transport in St. Pete because of the, the, the events at the venues, a lot of the senior centers, you know, and by, and by just being the biggest city. But no one wants to do that as far as cost savings. I think that would be huge because then what you're saying about the rest of the county trying to support St. Pete, they won't need that. And one more thing you might not know, that's emergency medical service on the fire side. Uh, if you look around most of the uh, smaller beach communities, they have uh, small departments, fire departments and whatnot. But on the apparatus side, we have the huge ladder trucks. 
Now those communities are buying ladder trucks. You know why? Because St. Pete got one. So why would you go buy a ladder truck? They have what they call mutual aid. They're going to go there anyway. If you call, they all got condos, but nobody bought a big huge ladder truck. <laughs> they're just going to, I'm serious. And they call the St. Pete come running with all this apparatus and put out the fire and, and that's mutual aid. So it's, it's a little different. I just think that they're just putting hairs on that because at the, the end of the day, what it comes down to is this. When you dial 911, you got a medical emergency. In St. Pete, normally we get there around under five minutes, five minutes or less, okay? Anywhere beyond eight minutes is what they call body bag time. What they're sitting and talking about doing, they'll let <clears throat> um, uh, a municipality respond in seven and a half minutes, which is less than the eight minutes, at a cost savings. But if you lay on that floor with chest pain, I don't want you laying that another second. And my son's a, a diabetic, he has juvenile diabetes, and I dial 911 often when he's in a, almost in a comatose sweat because of low blood sugar overnight. And um, even though they get there under five minutes, that's still a long time to watch your, your loved ones suffer. And that's what we're getting into. It's, uh, it's touchy. Uh, now this thing they got they call uh, priority dispatch is really crazy because you can be across the street from a fire station and because uh, they, uh, the, the million questions they ask you, what they got your 911, will say that, well, you just need an ambulance, you know, because you fell down. But you might have fallen down because you had a stroke. <laughs> well, that fire station will never get a call. And the, and the ambulance got up to 10 to 15 minutes to get there. So you'll be laying there for 10 minutes waiting on them to come. You know, right now, the way it works is our EMS get there in under five minutes, get you stabilized, get you prepped. An expensive EMS taxi ride comes up at the tune of five hundred something dollars mm -hmm. to take you yeah, to the I hospital. Yeah, I paid that last year. Right, and that's why I always ask you, you want to go to the hospital? Want to go to the hospital? That's how they get paid. They got to take you to the hospital. But what we're proposing is, if we're getting in under five minutes, we're having you transport you. We transport. We have several officers get shot. We think transported them. So we do transport, and we were transporting before this uh, problem we had with EMS. And the reason the whole thing arose is they had a problem up in North County. I think where the county line splits, and they had an accident in that intersection, and nobody came because they couldn't determine who, what county, who was responsible. So when they got out there, and, and that person died, so after that, that's when they came up with the mutual aid. The mutual aid is working. Is there some waste in the system? Yeah. I would, to make it really fair, pay them on the calls they run. They don't want to do that because we run over 42,000 EMS calls out of the city of St. Pete. The second closest uh, municipality is Clearwater which runs about 20. So this, if you pay them on call, that wouldn't be fair to the smaller communities who don't run that many in this call. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know. But what they're proposing is just to try to cut it and tell you that if they cut, say, I don't know, about say $6 million and give us $6 million instead of 12, uh, then we got to help the people the best way we can. And it might take, I don't know, 10 minutes or more to get there, so you got to lay there. That's what that's all about. But I just, when it comes to your life and it's your money, you know what I'm saying? You pay for that. I, I, I want to make sure when you dial 911, someone comes. And don't be always be uh, um, boggled down when they talk about a 40% increase. Well, every time they say that, I say put a dollar amount to that increase. That 40% increase may be 26 cents per $100,000 value on a house. See what I'm saying? If you got a $300,000 house, that's 75 cent increase on your tax bill. <laughs> you know, but they make it sound so catastrophic. You're like, there's no way I'm paying 40%. I always say, when you say the percentage, put a dollar amount next to it, per $100,000 of value. That way you'll know. So I mean, my house for $100,000, I'm going to pay $26. Cent. And right now, it's in the toilet, it's around $75,000. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I, I, I went all over, but uh, you had three or four questions. I hope like Yeah, I, had, uh, I also was wondering, because you're, you're talking about the funding, yes. and what it appears that St. Pete gets uh, a great deal of its funding from the red light cameras. And that's how they're, <laughs> is that how they're funding uh, the pier here? You mean the red light camera safety program? Yeah, yeah. I didn't say anything safe about it at all. <laughs> that's what they call it. Yeah, the, that, that is. Uh, the redistribution they, program. Yeah, they're, they're not getting uh, the, the money they thought they'd get. I think the mayor budgeted like 900000 They got around six. The red light camera company got a ton of money, and the state got a ton of money, but we didn't get much. And I can tell you unequivocally, uh, I'm, you know, madly against that program. And someone said it wasn't a second, it was a second. And the people that are against it on council, myself, Leslie Curran, and Steve Cornell. But it, as you can see, that's not enough to get, you know, to get it turned over. And every time I make a motion, we get three to five votes. 
which is basically the way it goes. But what happens is they're proposing a safety program um, and it's supposed to help save lives. And, and, and um, what's happening is over two thirds of the tickets are for turns. Right hand. Yeah. In right the, on reds. Right. And in the intersection, the turns represent 0 .006 of the accidents at the intersection. I'm talking way down. So in other words, there's no safety problem with turns. But that's what they make all the money at. If you come up to a, a red light camera, you'll see a sign that says a red light camera enforcement. And then below it's a little additional sign they add it says right turns too. <laughs> Because that's what they make their money. Because if you think about it. Well, then they're changing the laws without changing the law. Correct. And, and the way they do that, they use, it's an ordinance violation, not, a, not a, a, a law violation, if you will. And what they're doing is, in the driver's book, it tells you to come up to the stop bar. In my driving book, it says, look left, look right, look left again, and to proceed safely in the lane of traffic as you make your turn. Well, the, the big money people in Tallahassee, when they were writing the red light camera legislation, they came over to the, the, the elected officials and said, look, if they look left, look right, they're going to stop and we ain't going to make no money. So let them turn right on red as long as it's safe and prudent. That's the key word, safe and prudent. And safe and prudent goes from 11 miles an hour to 13 miles an hour while you're making a turn. Who made that determination? Safe and prudent. <laughs> It's I, a, I, didn't, I didn't see that written, 11 to 13 anywhere. It is, but that's why you see our, our assistant attorney, Mr. Mark Wynn, has got not one but two tickets for right-hand turns and beat both of them. Now, I asked the attorney, we have a, uh, an ordinance that our city legal department enforces in court. Then we have the assistant attorney who's over them in court against them, beating tickets that we are enforcing. But they say there's no conflict, so I took them on their word. <laughs> but, they, but okay, okay. Um, but in any event, to close on that, they they have um, the the court, the courts, not just uh, Pinellas, but also over in Tampa and Sarasota, have told the cities to stand down with these camera tickets because the law is broken. And um, even uh, Pat Frank over in Tampa, she talked about um, you can run the red light camera, you run a red light ten times, zoom through it, and if you pay the bill within thirty days, no one ever see it. But on that 11th time, you fly through it and you kill a whole family. The judge will never know you flew through a light 10 times before, you know, within the year. That's why they go on a point system, because they want, if you get a moving violation, 12 point, they don't want you out there if you're dangerous and not abiding by the laws of the road, like everybody should. Have. So but there's a lot of problems in there, but, you know, they, they're going to fix it. Wink, wink. And also yeah. the running, the, the yellow light timing. And you know, you'll see my colleagues say, well, don't run red lights. Well. If we shorten the time, so when you get out there, we get a picture of you in the middle with a red light, you ain't running a red light, we just manufacturing that. Right. That's why you hear them defend that there was yellow light timing, but there's legislation moving about yellow light timing in Tallahassee and also right hand turns. Right. I think if they can pass both of those, they'll pretty much kill it. Where did you say that was written about the 11 to 13 miles per hour? That's in the, that's in the, it's in the if you look at the law, it's called the, um, I forget what the name of the law, but it's, it's pertaining to the red light camera. It's written in there about safe and prudent. And the, the, safe and, the, and prudent is 11 to 13. They said you can turn as long as it's 11 to 12 miles an hour. And what they do, they, they, they got things in the road that clock your turn. And that stuff doesn't work. We got a guy that made a right hand turn at 97 miles an hour, according to the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> we also have another guy that went through the intersection at 240 miles an hour. Wow. Well, cars don't go that night, what well, NASCAR might. <laughs> <laughs> Not even that. I mean, but, but we had our, also our police officers over the program. Stand there and say, "Well, well, we don't go with equipment, but duh." <laughs> but that's it's safety. Remember, yes. I, I just want to thank you. My my 93 year old grandmother lives in in St. Petersburg, and her property taxes have just skyrocketed. And we're talking in a field, and all this other stuff. Yeah. So, thank you for being a fiscal responsibility voice. Yeah. On well, we got a lot of that going. I mean, you look at now. You're looking at a, a budget shortfall. They're proposing a two or three million dollars. Um, and it's election year, and a lot of these uh, labor organizations, these promises, and I'm, uh, you, you support me, the checkbook will be wide open. Well, if we $3 million shut, where the hell the money going to come from? Uh, and we did have an increase, the first one in, I think, about nine years last year, and I thought it was enough. But what you should know in those increases, my colleagues always uh, allow the uh, administration to hoard um, the one or two million dollars and stick in their reserves. And that money's there for the help, and it's protected by resolution. And the re resolution says, in case of budget shortfalls, 
what the budget shortfall, you should be able to use that money to help the people and not raise taxes on them. But they want to have a fat, healthy, overbloated reserve so they can borrow more money that you got to pay back and pay debt service on. And that trial, we owe about $100 million on that. Yeah. And what? The, and the debt service payment, uh -huh. the debt service payment is over $10 million a year. So the team is making money, but the, the share they give us, we have to put money with that to pay off the debt. And the way it works is the debt's up here and everything else is below. When the money comes in, debt, employees, contracts, all that stuff is below. So the debt gets the first chunk of the money. And what they're doing, if you ask, we don't want to touch reserve because it'll affect our bond already. It's all about borrowing more money to indebt more people. So I thank you guys.